Hey guys, uh, this is a talk on implicit differentiation. Hopefully this puts a little more color on things. Uh, we have to start with understanding what this notation exactly means. So for now, or up until now, all we've said is dy dx means find the derivative of y. And, and that really has been really about it. Uh, let's look at it maybe from a picture's point of view. So this is the y value, this is the x value. Let's say I wanted to find what dy dx was at this point, whatever that point happens to be. So it's obviously some x value, and there's a corresponding y value to it. So at that point, x comma y, what is dy dx representing? Now, dy dx really means what is the change in y when we change x ever so slightly? So how much is y changing if we move x slightly a little bit to the left or we move it a little bit to the right. And this idea hopefully sounds familiar. So if we start with, say, this point, if we really move a lot and call that distance h, we've seen this construction before. This point would be f of x plus h. Another way to represent this y-coordinate would be to write it as f of x. And then this question really becomes, this would be f of x plus h minus f of x. And then, really, how much is it changing by? Well, you make a secant line, you find the slope of the secant line, and that is our old friend, the difference quotient. Now, hopefully, you also remember from when we discussed this at numerous times of the semester, the limit of the difference quotient gives us the instantaneous rate of change, or the derivative, which has this notation dy dx. So when we are finding dy dx, what we're really saying is move x ever so slightly to the left or to the right. So wiggle it ever so slightly. This variable on the bottom is always the one that's being wiggled. And then the question is asking, how much is the variable on top changing by? So if I were to clean this up a bit, and instead of going that far away, h might be very large there, what happens if I go ever so slightly to the right? So whatever this x value is, the question then becomes, if I change x from here to there, how much is this y value changing by? And the smaller and smaller and smaller the wiggle I make, or the smaller the x value changes from left or to the right, the corresponding ratio that we get, the change in y over the change in x, is the derivative. So what this notation is really saying is, how much does y change by if we change x ever so slightly? And that's really what a derivative actually is. How much is the output value of a function changing if we ever so slightly maneuver the input value? Now, this might seem unrelated, but it is, and I hope that it makes sense a little bit in a bit in the future. So here, it would be good to review chain rule. Chain rule states that if we have the derivative of a composition of functions, f of g of x, the way we find that is by saying you find the derivative of the outside by keeping the inside the same times the derivative of the inside. So this is hopefully not uh, strange to anyone at this stage. Now, we're going to do something clever. We're going to say, hey, let this g of x function be y. And you'll see why no pun intended, we're doing this in a minute. So if we replace g of x with y, we can rewrite this chain rule as the following. We can say that, hey, if we were trying to find the derivative of this function with respect to x, that's really just saying find the derivative of f of y, because g of x is getting replaced with y. And then we can apply the same chain rule as above. Find the derivative of the outside function, keeping the inside the same times the derivative of the inside function. Now, another notation for this, and I'll keep using this again and again in the future, is we can also write this in Leibniz notation. So ddx of f of y, chain rule here, find the derivative of the outside, keeping the inside the same, times the derivative of the inside. Now, you might be wondering, why on earth would anyone want to do this? reason for that is that what this allows us to do is find the derivative of a function of y 
with respect to x. We found the derivative of a function of y with respect to x without even knowing what that relationship was. So here we're finding f prime of y that we can find. We can find dy dx, but we don't even know what the exact relationship is between x and y. Is x four times y? Is y x squared? Is y, uh, you know, 4x minus 5 over 3 pi? We have no idea what that relationship is, and what implicit differentiation allows us to do is find how much an output value will change if we change the input value ever so slightly without explicitly knowing what the relationship is between the two functions or between the two letters. So let, let's see a couple of examples and hopefully that makes more sense. So here's a, a question that we should know how to handle from before. Find dy dx, so find the derivative of y with respect to x. So what that really means now is find the derivative uh, of a function named y where the independent variable is x. Or how much is y changing by if we change x ever so slightly? And here's the function that we're given, xy equals 1. Well, I don't know how to find the derivative of this yet. But what I can do is divide both sides by x. So I can rewrite this expression as y equals 1 over x. I can rewrite the right-hand side as x to the negative 1. And then I can find the derivative. I can say y prime or dy dx is equal to applying the power rule, bring down the power, subtract 1. And that gives us negative 1 x to the negative 2. And this is just rewriting the same exact thing. Not necessary, but just doing it for the sake of completeness. Now, what we can say here is that y is explicitly defined as a function of x. What that means is, if the x value in the function y equals 1 over x is changed ever so slightly from x equals 3, the y value, the compensating y value change, will be by negative 1 over 3 squared, uh, negative 1 over 3 squared, which is negative 1 ninth. So uh, now I think it makes sense to talk about what exactly is an explicitly defined function versus an implicitly defined function. An explicitly defined function is one where the function can be solved so that you have one variable on one side and all the other variables on the other side. So here, this is an example of an explicitly defined function because I can get y by itself on one side and have all the x's on the other side by themselves. Now, this is not always possible or easy. So it might be that it's impossible to get y by itself or get x by itself or get the output variable by itself. Or it might not be terribly easy, and it's not a good use of our time to sit there and try to figure out, oh, what would be the explicitly defined function, and how is it that we would be able to differentiate this? Another need for this, which I didn't really write down, it's a fringe case, but what happens if you want to find the derivative of something that is not a function? What happens if you have a relation that you want to find the derivative of? The relation side of things was explained very well in AP Classrooms. I'm, I'm sort of leading on that for the explanation there. But here I'll deal with mechanically how to find the derivative uh, using implicit differentiation. So again, implicitly defined functions are those where the relationship between the variables is given implicitly, meaning we don't know exactly what it is other than to say that they are related somehow. That there is some equation, we just don't know what it is, so it's either not even possible to figure that equation out, or it's certainly not easy to do that. So we don't bother trying. So here's an example. Let's say that we're asked to find the derivative of y. How much does the y variable change if I change x ever so slightly? Given that, and then here's a relation. There's a relation between x's and y's. There's sine of y plus y cubed equals 6 minus x cubed. There is nothing absolutely nothing you can do to solve this equation for y. A single y by itself on one side with only x's on the other side. No matter how much you try, you will not be able to do it. And at this moment, I would actually like for you to pause and convince yourself of that. Try to get y by itself. Maybe 
uh, you know, move the y cubed over to the other side and take the inverse sign and try to get this y by itself. And you'll notice that the act of moving the y cubed over does not allow there to be a single y on one side of the equation with only x's on the other side. Similarly, what happens if we take sine y and toss it over and then take the cube root of both sides to get the y by itself? Uh, convince your, pause the video, convince yourself that it really is not possible to get y by itself so we can find the derivative of an explicitly defined function as we've done in the past. So here's the formal way of writing the solution out. I, I copy down my question again, sine of y plus y cubed equals 6 minus x cubed. Now, another way to write this, to basically understand that this is an implicitly defined function, is to say, I don't know what the relationship between y and x is, but it's some function y of x. So instead of writing y here, I can rewrite this as, hey, I know that this is not just y, it's dependent on x. Similarly, this y could be rewritten as y of x cubed. The right-hand side is just the function of x, so that just gets written as it is. Now, in order to find dy dx, we have to differentiate a function named y with respect to x. So that is why I wrote differentiating both sides with respect to x. We need to make sure we are differentiating with, the right, with respect to the right variable. Later on in the course, in short order, we will be changing from differentiating with respect to x to maybe differentiating with respect to y, or maybe with respect to t, time. Uh, that will be called a related rate, and we will be able to differentiate with respect to anything. So now it's going to become important to say, if someone says find the derivative, you always have to ask the question, with respect to what? Are we differentiating with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to t? Uh, we don't even have a t in the problem, and it's going to be possible to do that. So here, this is the notation that says that I'm about to take the derivative of this stuff with respect to x, and similarly, I'm about to take the derivative of this stuff with respect to x. So the derivative of sine of y of x will be given by chain rule because I have a composition of functions. The derivative of the outside will be cosine, keeping the inside the same, so cosine of y of x times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of y of x is simply y prime of x. The derivative of this, again, we would need chain rule, parentheses, and a power. So I would bring the power down, subtract 1 from the exponent, so 3 comes down, keep the inside the same, times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of y of x would just be y prime of x. The derivative of 6 is 0 because it's a constant and the derivative of negative x cubed is negative 3x squared. Now you'll notice that I didn't do anything additional here, and I'll explain that, well, I guess we might as well talk about it now. How much is 6 changing by if we change x ever so slightly? It's not. 6 has nothing to do with x, so it's not changing at all. That's why the derivative of a constant function is always 0. How much is negative x cubed changing by if we change x ever so slightly? It's changing by negative 3x squared. So you can prove this using the limit definition of the derivative, or you can just apply power rule and get that. Here, on the other hand, or maybe this one's a little bit easier, why is it that we have to use chain rule here? It's because y is not being differentiated with respect to y. It's been differentiated with respect to x. So the question is really asking, how much is this function moving by, or changing by, when we wiggle x ever so slightly? So it's a composition of functions that we're differentiating. That's why we have to use chain rule here, but not here. Now, what we can note is that y prime of x is just different notation for y prime, or dy dx. So on the left-hand side, I wrote out the same exact solution with y prime. On the right-hand side, I wrote it out with dy dx, and hopefully you'll see that the answer is the same at the end. So we have cosine instead of y of x, I wrote y. Instead of y prime of x, I wrote y prime. Plus 3y of x squared times y prime of x equals 0 minus 3x squared. 
Now, the goal is to find dy dx or find y prime. So here, we can isolate these y primes by factoring them out. So if I factor it out on the inside, I'll be left with cosine of y plus 3y squared. That's what's left over here. And then finally, in order to isolate y prime, we can divide this sum over to the other side. So we would have negative 3x squared over cosine of y plus 3y squared. The reason why we don't necessarily want to use this notation, especially moving forward when we will have multiple variables, is this tells me that I'm finding the derivative of y, but I have no idea with respect to what. Here, if I'm using this notation, or y prime of x, I still know that I'm differentiating with respect to x. But if I just use prime notation, I use that, that, that fidelity. I have no idea uh, what or which variable, uh, no, tying myself in a knot here. I have no idea with respect to which variable I differentiated this function y. Whereas if we use this notation, and this is really going to be the one that I use most frequently in the future, is we can rewrite cosine of y of x as just cosine of y. y prime of x is just another way of writing dy dx. With this notation, you know exactly what you differentiated, the variable on top, with respect to what you differentiated, x on the bottom. 3y of x squared times y prime of x, dy dx, equals 0 minus 3x squared. Now again, remember that we were asked to solve for dy dx, so I can factor out a dy dx, that's the same in both terms, leaving behind cosine of y plus 3y squared. You'll notice that it's the exact same thing here. All we're doing is, instead of factoring out a y prime, we're factoring out a different notation for it, dy dx. And then again, as we did before, we divide this over to the other side, and we're left with dy dx. Notice here that in either form, this is the derivative on the right-hand side, and the derivative does not just depend on the x variable. It does not depend on just the input variable as it has in the past. It depends on both x and y. We have to know the x-coordinate at the point where we're finding the derivative and the y-coordinate. Now, historically, we haven't needed to know that information because all the functions that we differentiated in the past were explicitly defined functions. So if we go up a little bit and take a look here, you'll notice that y prime or dy dx only depends on x because this is an explicitly defined function of x. I don't care about what the y value is. So if I wanted to find dy dx for this function at x equals 5, all I would have to do is plug in 5 here. Or if I wanted to find what, has, what happens to the y value at x equals 3, I would just need to plug in 3 here. Here, on the other hand, because I have an implicitly defined function, I would have to know both the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate whenever I'm finding the derivative. A point of note, because this will happen very frequently, my exams on the AP exam, you will need both the x and the y-coordinate. But more often than not, you will only be given one of them. Either the x-coordinate will be given or the y-coordinate will be given. In order to find the other coordinate or the missing coordinate, you always go back to the original equation. Because if we know the y-coordinate, I can plug it in here and solve for x. If I need the x-coordinate, it'll be actually quite difficult, but using a machine you could do it. You could plug in x here and then graph the function and then figure out what the y-value is. Uh, let's go over to another example. Uh, this is how it would, could potentially show up on the, uh, on the upcoming exam. Th this would be a good way of sort of throwing everything together into a ball. Again, please don't hold me up to this expectation that the same exact question will show up or the same exact type of problem will show up. But a, a type of this question needs to be understood from every which way in order to be able to do the ones on the test. So let's say we have this implicitly defined function, xy squared minus 2x cubed equals 2, and we're told we only care about y values where y is positive or 0. We don't care about negative y values. And the first question is find dy dx. So this is saying find the derivative of a function named y with respect to x. Change x ever so slightly and figure out how much y changes by. 
So the denominator, the variable in the bottom here tells us what we have to differentiate with respect to. So if we differentiate with respect to x, we can write d dx of the left-hand side, d dx of the right-hand side. I did the same exact thing here. I made a note of what I was differentiating with respect to. I differentiated the left-hand side with respect to x. I differentiated the right-hand side with respect to x. Now at this stage, we actually start finding the derivative. So we read this as find the derivative of x times y squared. The moment I say the word times, I need to remind myself I have to use the product rule. Derivative of the first, that's 1. Derivative of x with respect to x is just 1. So you can also write uh, the change. How much does x change by if x changes a little bit? Well, by that change. So here we can write it as dx dx How, uh, times the second. So maybe I should write this down. Derivative, come on, pen. Derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. So we found the derivative of the first, and then we just wrote down the second y squared plus the derivative of the second well, the derivative of y squared would just be 2y using the power rule. But remember that y is an implicitly defined function of x. So we have to use chain rule. The derivative of y squared would be 2y times the derivative of the inside function y would be dy dx times the first. So that takes care of that. Then we have the derivative of negative 2x cubed the negative 2x cubed can be differentiated using power rule. Bring down the power, subtract 1, so you get negative 6x squared times, now you can say this is an implicitly defined function of x itself, so you have dx dx. You can also think of this as what variable did we just, or you, just differentiate with respect to what. So here I differentiated x with respect to x, so I have an x on top and x on the bottom. When I was finding the derivative of y squared, I found the derivative. What did I differentiate y with respect to what? x. Excuse me. Here, what did we find the derivative of? Which letter? x. That goes on top. With respect to what? x. That goes on the bottom. What's the derivative of 2 with respect to x? It's a constant, so the derivative is 0. Now here, we can clean this up and say, well, 1 times anything is going to be itself, and dx dx is just 1. How much does x change by if x changes a little bit? It changes by 1. So this is going to give us just y squared. That goes there. x times 2y can be rewritten as 2xy, dy dx, dy dx. Minus 6x squared, minus 6x squared, dx dx is simply 1, equals 0. The question was to find dy dx. That means I need to get that term that has dy dx in it by itself and move everything else over to the other side. So if I move negative 6x squared over, I get positive 6x squared. If I move y squared over, I get negative y squared. And then finally, in order to get dy dx by itself, I can divide the 2xy over. That's my derivative. Now, what does one do with derivatives in Calc 1, especially at the stage where we are? You can be asked to find the slope of the tangent line at a given point, or you could be asked to find the equation of the tangent line at a given point. We haven't really done anything else so far with it. So this becomes a natural part B on a free response question to write the equation of the line tangent to the curve at this point. Now, this is one of those nicer questions where the x and the y value is given. As I said earlier, if you're given the x value, you need to plug it into the original equation to figure out what the y value would be. And had we been given the y value, we would need to plug it into the original equation to figure out the missing x value. In this case, the question is nice in that it gives us both. So the slope can be given by finding the derivative and plugging in 1, 2, the point, which gives us this, and that can be cleaned up to give, you a, give us a half. Now, a point I want to make for the actual test that we take and for the actual AP exam as well, this is perfectly fine. You can stop right here. 
don't waste time doing these additional simplifications unless you need to. And you will never need for that to be the case. You can stop right here and not go any further. When you have to write the equation of the tangent line, you can say y minus y1. Now here I wrote 1 half because that's what my derivative simplified to. You will get full credit if you copy this entire expression correctly in for the slope right here, as long as you use parentheses around the whole thing. So in fact, let me do that. This is the exact same thing as y minus 2 equals 6 times 1 squared minus 2 squared over 2 times 1 times 2 times x minus 1. Both of these equations will get you full credit. So this is where I would recommend saving a bunch of time, although going from here to there and there to there and there to there is not terribly time consuming. But if you're crunched for time, don't do it. Or stop here, and time permitting, you can go back and do these simplifications. But don't waste your time doing things you're not getting points for. On the other hand, if uh, this becomes a plus 4 magically or by accident, and then you end up with 10 over 4, and then that simplifies to 5 halves, you will lose points because you did something you weren't supposed to or you didn't need to, and you did it incorrectly. So you don't get any points for getting the simplified version to 1 half, but you do lose points for simplifying incorrectly. Not worth it. Don't do it. Uh, I will give you full credit either way, assuming it's correct. Uh, next, we have uh, find the x-coordinate of the point P at which the tangent line is horizontal. A tangent line is horizontal. A line is horizontal if the slope is 0. In calculus land or in calc 1 land, how is it that we find the slope of the tangent line? Well, we find the derivative. And we found the derivative. The derivative is right here. This is dy dx. So if I want to know where the tangent line is horizontal, I need to set my derivative function equal to 0. If I wanted to know what the slope of the tangent line was at a particular point, I would plug it in just like I did here. But if I want to know where, so I need to know the location of a point where the tangent line has a particular slope, I need to set my derivative equal to that and then solve for x or y, depending on whatever variable we're being asked for. So in this case, we're being asked to find the x-coordinate. So we, set, we take my derivative, our derivative, and we set it equal to 0. We can multiply 2xy over to the other side and get 6x squared minus y squared equals 0. 0 times 2xy is 0. We can add the y squared over to the other side, and then we get to 6x squared equals y squared. Now, I would like for you to pause the video at this moment and think about how you would get a value of x from this. This is the equation you're given. You already set it equal to 0. How is it that you can come up with the x-coordinate where the slope is 0 given just this piece of information? Hopefully you've thought about this and realized that there is no way to do it from just 6x squared equals y squared. We cannot solve an equation for x if we don't know what y is or what y squared is. But hopefully you remember what I said earlier in the video, where if we're given the x value, we have to go back to the original equation to find the y value. If we're given the y value, we still have to go back to the original equation to find the x value. In fact, that's exactly what we do here. We recall that the original equation is this, xy squared minus 2x cubed equals 2. We can add the 2x cubed over to the other side, yielding xy squared equals 2 plus 2x cubed. We can divide both sides by x. That gives us y squared equals 2 plus x cubed over x. Now you'll notice that this equation cannot be solved because it's one equation in two variables. Well, what happens if I swap out this y squared with this expression of just x? And in fact, if we do that, if we substitute this expression in for y squared here, this results in something that we can actually complete or compute. 6x squared. 6x squared equals y squared, but y squared is 2 plus 2x cubed over x. So that goes right here. And now this is an algebra 2 problem or an algebra 1 problem. 
Multiply both sides by x, and that yields 6x cubed equals 2 plus 2x cubed. Subtract the 2x cubed over, get all the x's to one side. That gives us 4x cubed equals 2. Divide by 4 to isolate the x. Take the cube root of both sides, and you get x equals the cube root of 1 half. So what this means is, excuse me, when x is equal to or at x is equal to cube root of 1 half, the tangent line to the curve that we were given is horizontal. It means that the slope is 0, and you can confirm, and in fact I would pause the video myself if I were you and do this. Take this x value, plug it into the original equation to figure out what the y value would be, and plug in both those x and y values into your derivative to confirm that you do actually get 0. I think it would be a very good exercise to practice. And then finally, uh, something else that can be asked is find the second derivative. So hopefully you remember that this notation d2y dx2 means find the second derivative of a function named y with respect to x. And the point is the same. 1 comma 2 is the same point we had earlier. So let's write down our givens. We know from part b, or part a rather, where we found the derivative dy dx was 6x squared minus y squared over 2xy. In order to find the second derivative, we need to find the derivative of the first derivative. So we need to find the derivative with respect to x of dy dx, which is to say we need to find the derivative with respect to x of this function, which is indeed dy dx. Now if we take a breather and pause here for a second, we can see, hopefully, obviously, that this is a quotient rule problem. Bottom comes first times the derivative of the top. Now remember that we're differentiating with respect to x. 6x squared's derivative will be 12x times dx dx, which is simply 1. So I can move on, minus y squared. Remember, y is an implicitly defined function of x. So I would have to use chain rule here. The derivative of negative y squared would be negative 2y times the derivative of the inside function which would be dy dx. So this is bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top, 6x squared minus y squared, times the derivative of the bottom. In order to find the derivative of 2xy, what I did was I grouped 2x together and I put y by itself. So I have two functions being multiplied. I use the product rule. So derivative of the first, derivative of 2x would simply be 2 times the second y plus the first 2x times the derivative of the second. The derivative of y is simply 1 times the derivative of the inside, which is dy dx. Now some people might say, hey, I, I know that the derivative of y is just dy dx. Why are we doing this thing in the front? This is just being done to really drive home the point that y is an implicitly defined function of x, so we have to use chain rule. So the derivative of the outside function would just be 1 times the derivative of the inside function would be dy dx. All over bottom squared, so 2xy, the quantity squared. The question was to find the second derivative of the function y with respect to x at this point. So if we plug in 1 and 2 for all the x's and y's, we get that. And I'll let you verify that if you clean all this up, you end up with 15 over 8. Last thing uh, that I want to say, if you're doing this on my free response test or on the AP exam, please stop right here. So I did it all the way to the end so that you have a sense of closure and you can see, okay, the, the answer is about, you know, less than 2. 16 over 8 would be 2 exactly. So it, it's, the second derivative is not very, very large. It's about, it's a shade less than 2. However, you gain absolutely nothing by doing all of this correctly. And in fact, if you make a minor sign error, the whole thing is going to lose you points. Please don't do that. Please don't waste time doing things you're not getting graded for or you're not getting any benefit from. And I think that's it, yeah. Hopefully this is of use and hopefully this clarifies a bit on mechanically what needs to happen when we're finding derivatives implicitly. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out.